Hello everyone and welcome to what is only my second explainer tutorial video. I planned to do a video on the Palmerland controller last weekend, but I got carried away having fun with it. If you look at the last few videos on my channel, you'll see the controller in action in a few different ways. And I had a few comments from internet friends uh, asking about it. So this video will be all about different ways in which you can use it to control the Coco Qantas. Uh, so what have I got? I've got a cup of tea, I've got a cocoa, I've got a Palmerland controller, I've got some effects, I've got a lot of banana cables, and we're ready to go. But first, I'm going to do the div kit thing and play some samples of what's coming up later in the video. Now, this video assumes that you kind of know what you're doing with the Coco Qantas. I'm not going to make an explain a video for that, as YouTube user Femi Fleming has already made a really, really excellent one. And there is also the wonderfully detailed tasting guide <coughs> that you can see here. You can find on the Mod Wiggler forums written by Josh Singer. I will make sure I link both in the description. So what is the Palmerland controller? It's a voltage controller in banana modular format, most commonly used to pair with Seattle on board devices such as the Coca Qantas, with which it shares this lovely wood design aesthetic. Palmerland Synthesizers is a one man band named Anders Palmerland, who hails from Denmark. And the only way to purchase these instruments is to message him directly on Instagram. I'll put the link in the description. He also makes a super duper version of Peter Blasser's Duba filter and another controller clock divider instrument called the Ample. Now, the Palmerland controller can be thought of as a banana cousin to the Make Noise, Make Noise No Control, which you can see here, or indeed the pressure points or and brains combo in Eurorack, which I love so much that I have them both, despite their near identical feature set. The controller does a few things that those Eurorack modules can't do, but it also lacks a few features that they have. The main way I use the controller is as a CV sequencer, principally for controlling the speed and hence pitch of the Coco Qantas buffers. We're going to see how that works, but first let's take a quick guided tour. In the center of the controller, are eight potentiometers in two rows which store control voltages. We have four purple banana jacks um, just above that that output the voltage of each column and switches beneath which selects which voltage is being output up for the blue knob, down for the red knob. <clears throat> Top left, we have a square wave LFO with a banana jack output. <clears throat> then we've got a clock input and a control voltage output for the sequencer. Over here, we have our four lovely, beautiful joypad gaming style buttons that have several functions I will do dive into in the video, and six banana jacks that relate to their features. Over on the right, we continue the uh, gaming theme with an analog joystick with X and Y outputs. <clears throat> there is, of course, a ground jack, which I've got connected to the Coco Qantas uh, on the side of the unit and a power supply input, which is 12 volt, 12 volt, 2.1 millimeter tip positive, just like your other Siap Lombard instruments. Now, I'm not gonna show you this for every patch, but let's take a quick, glue, quick look at how you can set accurate relative voltages with the controller. So this is what I do before I set up a jam. I'll start tuning the potentiometers in relation to the Coca Qantas to set up relative intervals that I want to see. Now, just a reminder here, the fixed control voltages are all sourced from these eight potentiometers. Um, so what I do is take a simple fixed note from a synth and record it into a buffer. So what I've got here is just a low C note from the SH-101. <clears throat> Uh, preferably something loud and clean works better here because uh, the more 
loud, bright the sound, the better the quality recording of the Coco Qantas. The 8-bit recording responds much better to an open filter, for example, than it does for a closed one. That doesn't stop you from using different sounds uh, when you actually record the segments that you want to pitch shift, but when you're starting out and tuning, it helps to go with a simple, clean sound. Um, you set the cocoa speed anywhere you like as a start point. I've gone for around 12 o'clock. And what's important to get right when you're first tuning, when you're tuning the first potentiometer is um, the attenuator here. Now, I've made the mistake in the past of getting halfway through the tunings and then thinking, oh, I might want two octaves up, and then realizing that I don't have the voltage headroom because I've set the attenuverter sorry, too low. Um, now, the good news is that there's such a wildly huge range um, here that you can um, <coughs> probably keep the attenuverter reasonably tight. I've got it set at about uh, 1, 130 there. Um, and that will give me enough room on this potentiometer, on all these kind of potentiometers, for um, about an octave and a half up or down, which is all um, I need for this. Um, and so now what I do is I'm going to connect um, the blue potentiometer here, because I've got the switch in up position. And you can see that that does not change in value, because I've got that set to be, um, to be no change in voltage. But if I go down there, you can hear, um, see an octave below, and you can also see that hopefully on, <coughs> on excuse me, on the uh, tuner in Logic that I'm screen recording along at the same time. So let's just go back up here. Here comes the tuning bit. So that's set to an octave below. Say I want to set this one to an octave above. Let's start to go. Up we go. See now, I've got a top two octave gap. Now here's the fiddly bit. Um, you either have to do that for all of these eight potentiometers if you're going to use the um, four by two sequencer, um, or you have to do it for each separate buffer if you just want to split into two banks of four. Um, and that's quite fiddly. Each one's not doesn't take that long. You heard that that was pretty quick. Probably took ten seconds or so, um, but it can get a little bit fiddly. Um, let's just do this one for now. You can imagine me doing the others. Um, if you have the attenuator set quite low, this makes tuning much easier than it does on the Coco itself because you get a far more physical distance between the notes and the octaves. And these potentiometers are fairly robust and stiff compared to the looser ones on the Coco itself. There we go, we have an octave. Okay, so let's talk buttons. Uh, if you watch some of the folks on YouTube who use a Coco Qantas, such as the excellent Two Round Robins, Luca Longobardi, or even Heinbach, you'll notice that they use small pieces of masking tape um, on the, around the speed potentiometer, and sometimes even on the attenuator as well, and that's so that they can quickly find what is an octave up or an octave down from their start point. Now, with something like the Make Noise Morphogene on Eurorack, you have helpful color changes on the pitch control that denote, that denote octave up and down. But on Coco, you have to do it by sight, hence the masking tape, or by ear. Now, controller to the rescue. With controller, we can use fixed control voltages coming from the controller into the pitch CV. And then we can switch between octaves. And so the blue jack here, represents the top row of potis, and that's going into the left-hand side of the Coco, where I've got a small loop that I made from the organelle. That you can hear that. That's at the original pitch. Ooh, two octaves down. You can hear it there at the various pitches. Let's turn that down. And then in the right hand side, I've got a different loop that I recorded from, again, from the organelle. That's being fed, uh, the sorry, the pitch of which is being um, changed from this red output, which represents the red for potentiometers here. 
Again, the buttons correspond left to right. One octave down, one octave up, and back to the middle. Okay, so now if we turn both up, we can play with it. Just add some effects. And there we go. Now, what we've also got with the buttons is we've got these four gate signals. If I <coughs> hold down the blue button, you get a gate on signal out of that blue output, which I've put here into the flip output of the left-hand side. And now you can hear that buffer going backwards. When I release, it goes forwards again. I'm going to do the same thing with the red and the right-hand side. Actually, that switched it to the right way around, so there you go. Things can get a little confusing with the color coding on the Palm and controller, and my only advice there is to use it a lot and you get used to it. But these four jacks, as I said, also output a gate signal every time you hit a button. Now, I'm going to bring in some input here too. I've got the trusty SH-101. With a little slow sequence there. Let's give that a little bit more release. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the joystick outputs to start controlling the amplitude of the buffers and the inputs. So, put the output there, one of them into positive, one of them into negative. And I'm going to do the same on the left hand side. Okay, next up, secret mode. And so I've now loaded something different into the Coco buffers, but I have the same octave up, octave down settings on the controller. But this time I'm gonna use the secret mode mini sequencer, which cycles through the four columns and also sequences the gate outputs on the jacks too. Now to activate secret mode, you hold down all four buttons, until that button starts flashing. Secret mode is now active. Now, while holding down the red button, you tap a little sequence on the others, and then you get these little this little gate sequence going here, you can see. And the cycle through the voltages is provided by <clears throat> excuse me, each cycle of the hold of the red button. I kind of didn't describe that right. Let me try it again. So, you can sequence the gates while holding down the red button. 
The limitation here is though that as the length of the red gate affects the cycle time of the button sequence, you want to quite quickly cycle through the voltages, uh, otherwise you end up with quite quick gate sequences. So we've gone for a slower sequence here, so you can hear Coco cycling through the different pitches of the buffers. And we've also got some gate outs that we could use maybe for the flips, for the skips, for fun stuff like that. I also have a little sequence on the SH-101. The buffers um, have recordings from the organelle, by the way. I think on the right you've got rings, on the right you've got plat, on the left you've got plats. So now we've got a nice little sequence coming in from the SH-101 as well. Let's add some hazy effects from the microcosm. mini sequencer which is activated by holding down all four buttons is cycling through each of the columns at a rate dictated by the on off of my press of the red button it'd be helpful here if we had some led feedback on the cycle here that only happens with the main sequence of which I'll go into a bit later. Okay, so I call this next patch 8-bit Therme. Um, one of my absolute favourite guitar pedals is the Chase Bliss Therme. There it is. Uh, when I used to play guitar through my old delay pedals, one of my favourite things to do with bucket brigade delays was to spin the time knob to create crazy feedback swells that would go up and up in pitch. Therme harnessed this idea and took analogue bucket brigades and added digital control to them so that you can accurately octave up and down your buffer, creating wild octave delay effects. Now we can do that with a combination of Coco and controller. So I've got the same octave sequence, well a similar octave sequence set up. Uh, actually this time I'm coming out of just the red knobs um, and I've got a bloop loaded and ready to go on the Chase Bliss blooper, so let's play that. this and then as you can see I've got Coco set to continuous record mode. Let me just turn up the buffers. That's just a nice 8-bit delay line. However, when I use the buttons and let's start with octave up, suddenly the buffers jump to an octave up. But then you can hear, then they go back to the same octave as the source material. What's happening there is when it jumps an octave up, it pitch shifts everything up, but then when it keeps recording over itself, it jumps back to the same pitch as the source material. So similarly, now if we go back to normal, we'll go down. back up. Fun with the buttons. So let's turn that into a sequence. All four buttons down. Wait for the flashing. Now I want to make this a nice slow one because I want to move through the different pitches quite slowly. I'm gonna just hit some 
gates in case I need them. This patch I came about accidentally while recording and forgetting that I had the button sequence engaged on the controller. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to recreate that by playing the buttons, which remember are causing octave shifts up and down on the buffers, is play the buttons at the same time as the buffer is recording so that when the buffer comes to play back, the speed changes are loaded into the buffer. It sounds pretty wild so let's take a look and listen i've got a sequence from the sh101 coming in just get it to an equal level left and right there we go and so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to record the buffer both buffers while playing around with the buttons let's go that's recorded in. Let's have a listen and see what it sounds like. Don't know about you, but I think that's really cool. You can, of course, then change the pitch again so that you get some really low and really high stuff which makes the cocoa sound really wild let's put it back to the original pitch and here you can hear the variations in pitch that the buffer has recorded directly in very weird very cool So far, we've been dealing with quite complex information in the buffers, lots of different notes. We can, however, put single notes in the buffers, as I've done here. Let me just stop the sequence. So single note across both buffers, and they're both set to the same pitch, and the attenuvert is set to the same amount, so I can sequence them both uh, from the same sequence. So the way that this mode works is you can hear the controller cycling now through all eight of the stored control voltages. Uh, the sequencer needs a clock, which comes from this onboard um, square wave output here that you can um, tweak up to audio rate modulation. That's fun to hear. We'll have a little bit of that in a second. Um, and so, let's just speed things up a bit. And at fast rates, you get this pretty cool sounding almost alien droid effect.
Fun stuff. Now, what the hell is Pamela's new workout, uh, Eurorack Imposter, doing in this patch? Well, nothing yet, but I am going to unplug the clock out from the controller and I'm going to replace it with a clock signal from Pam's. Now, Pamela's new workout has a clock going out to the Menchi Format Jumbler, which um, uh, converts your Eurorack signal to banana. It's also got a ground jack, important to con uh, to sync up to your Coco and to your controller. And you can hear it there hanging on some notes. The reason for that is if I go into um, output number one of PAMS, you can see I've got my favorite PAMS feature, which is random skip turned on. And so every so often, it's just skipping a clock and stopping on a note. Sounds really nice. Now something extra to that, I've also got another Eurorack out into my SH into my clock in of my SH101. So I can double up this line with a sequence from that as well. great next to your Seattle Lombard gear, excuse me. Uh, and the build quality is excellent. My only gripe on mind is that the joystick is fairly loose. Perhaps it's meant to be that way. I think if it were, um, if it were tipped up, it might, it might drop down. Um, but otherwise, the build quality is very, very excellent. The potentiometers are really, really stiff, which I think is a great juxtaposition to the loose ones on the Coco. Uh, the cons, it's a fairly expensive unit. Uh, message Anders for pricing. Look at the link in uh, the description. And listen, banana gear in general, it's fairly expensive due to its rarity and the small production runs of each instrument. Anders makes these to order, and it's made from beautiful wood as well. Um, it's highly likely to hold its value, however, and so you can tell yourself, tell yourself like I do, that it's an investment. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. Um, it's taken me a bloody age to make, way longer than I thought it would over the weekend. And so I have um, a continued but newfound greater respect for people who make explainer videos. Um, all of you, well done. Keep it up. Um, if you would like me to cover controlling either the deer horn or the Sidrax with the controller, please drop a comment on the video. Um, see you next time. <laughs>